that actually Cecil lived free and died free and he's better off. So again, that is not, he hasn't given us any evidence to prove that lions in captivity are mistreated to the point that it's better if they're living out live and then they're shot to death, right? Um, so again, he's not necessarily wrong. He just doesn't have the expertise to tell us this that we really can believe it. And again, he also uses this, you know, um, or if it was called peers, I'm not really quite sure about that. That must be a cultural thing that maybe other people in London or Britain would understand. I mean, Cecil is a pretty British name and so is Pierce, so I don't know. Um, now here he is, he says there are counter arguments. So here part of good ethos is being sincere and fair-minded, right? Now again, sincere can be difficult here because of the humor. It sounds like he's being tongue-in-cheek or flippant. So he might have a problem with appearing sincere because of that. But this looks like he's trying to be fair-minded, right? He he says here that he he doesn't doubt that people working in zoos really care about animals, so that's an effort to be fair-minded. Here, you know, um, he admits that his son um, is now interested in doing something in marine life and probably will be going to animal conservation because of this visit to uh, sea world or sea life. Um, so... There are a couple of places where he tries to, but again, he doesn't do a thorough job of rebutting it, right? Here, his argument to that uh, is this idea that it's first world privilege, that, you know, people live, who live in first world countries, right? That's countries that have a higher standard of living, they have a lot of luxuries, um, that we have the privilege of having animals in cages so that our children can see them as opposed to, you know, not being able to see them because they live in different environments, right? I don't know what that really has to do <laughs> with the argument about whether zoos, I mean, that would almost say that, well, it's good because then, right, there, there are many animals that none of us would be able to actually see up close because we can't travel the world, right? So that's a problem, right? That's not a really... Um, that's a non sequitur almost, right? Like it doesn't follow that one plus one ain't added up to two here, right? And then again, he comes back to this idea about kids don't have to see something to find it interesting. Um, again, I think there is some truth to that, but also both of these things that he mentions are things that actually do not exist. So they don't have any other option, right? Dinosaurs, you only have fossils. And I don't know about you, but going to the, you know, there's the Natural History Museum in Norman where you can see the dinosaur stuff, right? That's really interesting. And that's much more exciting going there. You can actually hold some of the bones. I have a picture of my niece when she's just looking with a dinosaur bone around her neck, right? Um, isn't that much more fun than just seeing them in a picture book? And Skylander's uh, student told me that's some kind of st stupid in his uh, video game, right? Again, our imagination can make some things much more fun looking at them because we don't have them in any other way. But I don't know about you, but now that there's a Hogwarts that you could go visit, boy, I'd much, I'd really like to go see that. I'm still happy with the books, but I would really like to go and be in there, right? Because then now there's a place you can visit. So again, I don't know that this is a real smart comparison here. And we don't have any evidence that this is actually true. I would say that for a lot of kids, being able to see something hands-on is much better than being able to read about it or watch about it because they're what we call kinesthetic, right? They like to be interactive, right? Um, and so again, he says here that people care about animals that work in zoos, uh, but there's a pretty strong argument. There's a negative effect on conservation awareness given that children take away the message that endangered species are probably okay because they have seen them in the zoo. That might be true, but again, he doesn't provide uh, any evidence, right? Let's see if we can Google... Or let's do this. Okay, so why are these bad for conservation? Okay, that's PETA. PETA is not a credible source because they are a a, a zealot, a group of zealots, right? So that would not be. Uh, but again, you can see where, what I would kind of look at to um, kind of determine if there's any truth to that argument that he's making. 
Uh, I did read somewhere where that only 15% of animals in zoos are actually on the endangered list. So most of the animals are not there. Uh, but again, no evidence here that says this is actually true. Um, and again, he says zoos and conservation spaces are impossible to effectively regulate. Again, he says, have a look online to see the number of cases of animals being killed because of lack of space. Horses being painted to look like zebras, animals in aquariums showing clear signs of distress. So let's look at this. Oh, so here in Encyclopedia, now Wikipedia is not necessarily, a, uh, you'd have to make sure that this is actually true because sometimes they'll say, we need somebody to verify this information. Um, so I don't know about you, but considering how many zoos there are in the world, that does not look like a really huge list. Now here it says, 215 of these rhesus macaque because they were infected with the virus, right? Okay, so here this says they were infected with the virus, right? Prevent inbreeding. Well, you know, we hunt deer because we want to make sure that the herd is culled um, to prevent inbreeding and, and make them healthy. So that's actually something we would even do in, uh, you know, in the real world. Um, Okay, insufficient space, that's that's the one thing, right? Uh, complaints about noise, right? That's not good. Genes were overrepresented. So again, that's the health of perhaps the animal. To make space for another male, that's not good. Arthritis, okay, that seems to be a humane reason, right? So again, multiple organ failure. So look at how many of these are, you know, probably the animal was quite old, right? And it, they just euthanize the animal out of compassion, perhaps. So... Again, that there's not a lot of evidence that that's true. Again, that's just the first thing we'd have to look at it, right? And this whole thing, if you look at like horses being painted to look like zebras, I Googled this and I was only able to find that there was a zoo in Cairo that did this. So again, one example, that's not sufficient to prove that there is a problem here. And then he ends this with a complete non sequitur, right? He starts talking, oh, oh, I'm sorry, where does he go? He talks about vegans. Where is it vegans, right? Um, in case you didn't know, if you're looking for a specific word, you can go up here to find and, oh, I'm sorry. Um, oh, here it says, uh, why are we not upset about the animals in tanks and cages or the ones that we eat, right? Again, that seems to be saying, well, should we be vegans, right? Just because we eat animals. So how is that connected with whether animals should be put in zoos, right? Um, a non sequitur. It's, it's kind of out of the blue and it doesn't really have anything to do with it because we're not raising animals in zoos to be eaten as food, right? So that's just totally off topic. Uh, and again, here talking about pets, well, Cats and dogs have been domesticated for a long time. They're not the same as wild animals in zoos. Um, and so, again, that's not necessarily, you know, he says he, he feels guilty about wanting to have a pet. Hmm. And then he ends with saying that he's also considering letting his children run free. And that is a complete, again, this is the comedian in him, right? But it ends with a really weird note that it's just like, again, that's not any way related to this, you could call this another false analogy that zoo animals and domesticated animals are not the same, that animals and kids are not the same, right? Um, and so again, his humor might fall flat and it might create like people who don't have a sense of humor might be wondering like, w what's going on here, right? So again, we have also, so you can see all the problems here. We have lots of pathos here, trying to make us feel bad about the animals, making zoos look like you know, really dangerous places, but not enough evidence to actually prove it. Are there zoos that should be shut down? Certainly, right? Again, in any organization, in any kind of entity you're going to find, I mean, there are colleges that should be shut down because they don't treat students well. They're, they're, you're right. But that doesn't mean that all colleges should be shut down, right? There are restaurants that have health uh, problems, so they're shut down. But that doesn't mean we're going to shut down all restaurants just because they all have the potential of, you know, having unhealth, unhygienic, right, violating health codes, right? So again, it's almost like he's giving us an either or situation, right? Either we keep zoos open or we keep them closed. There's only two choices. And 
the obvious choice is keeping them closed the way he's presenting it, right? And so that's a pure false dilemma, either or um, fallacy, right? So I hope that helps you understand, um, you know, what was wrong with this article. And again, in your rhetorical analysis essay, you're going to be doing the same thing with the, the essay, the article that you've chosen. You're going to look at ethos, pathos, and logos. You're going to give us a paragraph that analyzes each for its effectiveness. And then you're going to give us one to two paragraphs that analyze propaganda or fallacy present, right? Every article will have propaganda. That is just part of how we make appeals to people. But remember, propaganda is not necessarily bad. Sometimes it can be used for good. So you have to determine is the propaganda in this piece inappropriate in a way that really undermines the argument and you can't trust it? Or is it just a little blip, but it's not, it's not a death sentence for the credibility, right? Or are there logical fallacies, right? Which means one plus one does not equal two. And those might be uh, intentional. Maybe the person just unintentionally does not make a good case. They don't realize the, the lack of logic. It doesn't really matter if it's intentional or not. It just doesn't make sense, right? And again, it might be so bad that um, it, you know, it just negates the entire article, or it just might be a problem, but it's not overwhelming, right? So that's your job to discern that and show me that you understand how you can identify these things and that you can determine if an article is actually uh, good. I will tell you that there is a mix. The, the five articles that you get to choose from, some are very credible, some are very not credible, some are kind of mixed. So uh, again, you just need to do your diligence and uh, be thorough, right? Just look for these patterns and uh, let me know what's going on, right? So good luck. Email me if you got any questions. I'll see you later.